This is uh, the essence of new oak. This is simply water that's been in uh, new oak barrels to soak them tight. And it has this wonderful flavor and aroma of new oak. In fact, my friend from Navarro Vineyard, uh, last time he was down here, I was emptying one of these and it smells so good. It looks like urine, but it smells so good. Um, I was you know, saying, gee, it's a kind of a shame to throw this out. And he said, well, you should just add some alcohol and tartaric acid and call it Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's good. <laughs> Christ, what? Not good. I, I was just kind of curious what, what were people's general reaction when they heard that there was a winemaker that was actually producing some wines that were being critiqued by uh, Robert Parker Jr. as. Uh, upper scale 90s from yeah. from a very remote town called Bolinas. I mean, they find it's very strange. They don't really know what it means. If they've heard of Bolinas, they're sure the wine couldn't be any good. They, they kind of don't know what to do about it. Um, for some people, it makes perfect sense. But for other people, I don't know, there's almost a political aspect to winemaking that kind of interests me because uh, so many people, of the people involved in it on the producing and ownership end are basically pretty conservative white bread Republicans. You know, and they expect things to, they want conformity and they want control and they want, you know, a, a certain subtle form of racism in, the, in winemaking. I mean, wine racism, not personal racism. But, you know, in other words, it's only from certain plots of ground that, that good wines can mm -hmm. come, this kind of dog shit. And uh, so, you know, all of that kind of influences what people think about a winemaker. And in my case, some people like the fact love the fact that the wine is made under such unfavorable conditions with none of the usual support networks that almost any other commercial winery will have. Good morning. Good morning. How are we today? Oh, doesn't feel like it's quite day yet. <laughs> yes. Zero dark hundred is what <laughs> been in Lodi we turn right to you do our usual harvest right at the Lodi city limits and so we're going across Lodi and then to highway 99 south about three miles to some road or another that I've gotten written down here what are we doing here this is the material that I'm working with and it's just a matter of smelling it, tasting it, seeing how much of it's unripe, how much of it's overripe. Uh, I have a number of, of wines uh, now that are good but not worth releasing because they're lacking something. And this is intended to fill a hole in a couple of those wines. So it'll be used for a non-vintage blend and it could be very good for that. Grenache is very sweet. I mean, that is not because of the sugar, but it has a sense of sweetness on the palate, probably from a high glycerol content. And uh, it's just... It, can be very pleasant in sort of fleshing out a wine that's a little bit too angular and you know has a little <laughs> a little too much character. For somebody who wasn't a winemaker this would look kind of lousy. I mean some of the berries are raisins you can see and some of them are, are soft and kind of bagged up. It's a little bit looser but it's really a much better cluster of grapes from a winemaker's point of view. It's softer, the texture is much better. Uh, you can see there's even a little bit of color in the skins even as they're first crushed. Sugar is a lot higher and the flavor is going to be much more mature. Yeah. And at some point you go from um, what's a dried or drying grape to an actual raisin. I mean, it tastes like a raisin. I, I actually don't know what it is that makes that change to something that actually tastes like a raisin. I'm a great fan of old vines. And old vines in California were generally planted, I mean, obviously before Prohibition, and were generally vineyard blends. So in other words, they'd have some Grenache in part of the vineyard, some you know, Carignan, another part, uh, some Petite Syrah, whatever. 
and I like a lot of those vineyards. So the vineyard that I am uh, most excited about is one that I've been taking for a while now. And it was originally sold as being Petit Syrah, but I think in fact that it's real Syrah itself, and that's in St. Helena. It was planted in 1905, and that goes into my uh, Orion Old Vines. And that's the most, I think, uh, the best wine that I'm now making. So, And those grapes were very good this year, so that's going to be an excellent wine. I'm very happy about that. There are some that will just bag up slightly, like this or something, where it's, it's just it's soft, but it's not yet a raisin. And some of those can be excellent. Those will be very concentrated. Flavors are much better in that. I mean, that, you, know, you, could, you could make a decent wine from that. But I like going out here and feeling the fucking grapes, you know, just tasting them, looking at them, seeing how they hang on the vine. I mean, perfect example. I just finished telling you that I, that, that I like grapes that are slightly bagged, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're more concentrated. Well, the fact is, with the vineyard, with this particular vineyard, for some reason, most of the grapes, once they get to that point, in fact, are raisined. And they have that raisiny sort of taste, and I don't like it. So, I mean, I just told the, the guy, uh, uh, Keith, to, you know, not pick those grapes. Well, how could I possibly have made that decision if I hadn't been here? You know, I mean, I'd have been telling him to look particularly for those grapes, not to avoid them. So, it's that business of being that involved with it and following it all the way through that I think really makes the difference in the wine. Because then the wine truly is going to be a reflection uh, of your own taste and of your own character. Uh, this fermenter is long since finished fermenting. It's been on the, the wine's been on the skins as long as it needs to be. And what we're doing now is trying to uh, get it pressed before the, uh, the cap turns acetic returns bad. This cap that's formed on the top of the surface of a fermenting vat of wine um, is what has all of the color in it and all of the tannin and all of the flavor. Uh, so one of the winemaker's objects in making a good, a good red wine is to constantly keep mixing this back in in various ways with the fermenting mass of wine itself. And Grenache takes a great deal of that. So I'll pump wine out of the bottom from that valve down there and pump that wine back over the top of the cap. Uh, punch down the cap itself physically so that the actual skins are submerged back down in the, in the uh, uh, fermenting wine and so forth. And it simply takes quite a lot of that to uh, extract what needs to be extracted from Grenache. Uh, at the same time, Grenache, when, once it's finished, doesn't really taste that way. I don't want to splash you as well. That wine goodness. That's right. That's delicious. Grenache is funny. It's a very nice wine from a winemaker's point of view. Grenache is something that uh, can fill a certain hole in the middle palate of a, um, a wine that can be um, otherwise pleasant in the aromas, but rather austere uh, in the mouth. So Grenache is very sweet, so it gives an impression of sweetness. Obviously, there's no sugar in it. Um, and so that's what I use it for. I'm just checking it for that. Okay. Woo. Yeah, but any, but it's very enticing. I mean, you just want to keep drinking more of it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm real happy about that because I've got this um, Zinfandel under contract, or I can put under contract in Lodi. You know, that's certainly lightweight stuff, but it's got lots of fruit. And then I've got this Nebbiolo that's also very lightweight stuff. I mean, it's just, it looks like rosé, but it's got this really lovely aroma. So the two of them together, I think, uh, will be a very nice picnic wine. I really do. Okay, I'll make a, make a note there. Boy, that, God, that stuff is going out the door quickly. Now, we are now in okay, we are now in part of my barrel storage area, this obvious wreck. So. You can see the roof is ready to cave in any moment. That's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was very funny. Uh, you can see where all these squiggles are on the ceiling. Uh -huh. Well, that used to be covered with fiberglass as insulation, which really isn't necessary here anyway. But I mean, I thought it would be when I first put these things up 
thinking they'd be here for six months and of course now it's 10 years later. Anyway, I had that fiberglass up there and uh, some of it had fallen down, just a few little bits. And I came back one time when Janine was still working here and I said to Janine, hey, you know, uh, would you mind cleaning up some of that fiberglass there? And I came back about uh, two hours later and she said, God, that was the most awful job you gave me. It was just terrible. I'm just itchy and scratching. I've got this stuff all over. When she came in the time, was taking all of the fiberglass insulation off both oh, buildings. No. <laughs> A major client of mine from L.A. was here once uh, to taste. And I told him the place was pretty funky, but he clearly didn't think I was really being, uh, <clears throat> that that was really true. And uh, obviously, he was in a state of shock and felt he still had to say something on his way out. So on his way out, he said, gee, you know, Sean, I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I know anybody that makes better wine under worse conditions. <laughs> well, what a nice way of putting it. I thought it was pretty great, actually. When I thought about it, it was actually a compliment, you know? transferring wine between where I ferment the wine and where I have the long-term storage for most of it. So this is our own version of the wine train. Yeah. Yeah, these are all, you know, full, basically. Virtually every barrel in here was put in here as a new barrel. Uh, so it's obviously one of the major investments in winemaking. Um, you know, each of those barrels is uh, $600, essentially. These are larger, larger versions. These, these are made in the United States by a French cooper out of American oak uh, in the Calistoga. Otherwise, most of the oak here is, is French just because uh, it happens to work better with most of my wines. This is white wine, and you can see it's perfectly clear up here at the top, you know, right here. And this little teeny white layer right here that, that's brighter white than the rest of this, that's uh, 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 some uh, raw skim milk that I put uh, in here to fine it. The process of fining is when you put a, <clears throat> a protein in wine and it coagulates and drops out of solution, but it carries all of the uh, impurities in the wine down with it. It forms little tiny particles and those just fall down through the, the wine like a very, very fine net. And uh, they're negatively charged and most of the, of the particles that are in wine are positively charged. They simply attract them like little magnets and carry all these particles down through the wine. With red wine, I would normally use uh, egg whites. Uh, the egg whites are beaten up with a teeny little tiny touch of uh, salt um, or uh, potassium chloride, either one. And uh, then the egg whites are, are beaten into the wine and do exactly the same thing. They just very slowly fall down through the wine. That's right, it's my state-of-the-art wine lab. State-of-the-art. Share some of this, James. What is that? Just taste some. Just taste some. Trust me. Oh! <laughs> no, it's not. It's homemade brandy. <laughs> this is some stuff I distilled. Put some hair in your chest. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just uh, cleaning things up. Over. I thought I thought it was water in there. Wow. So, so I, I smelled it. It smelled okay. And so another I seventeen it. years in bottle, and this will be just fine. Yeah. Oh, come on, this didn't take that long. Actually, is it? that was a joke. Actually, I like it. I like right? it too. Actually, I do like it. It's good. Isn't it? Is it good? What is it made from? It's made from Pinot Noir. Yeah, and you can. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm definitely going to recommend to people from now on that they double decant it and make damn sure it's not too cold, because boy does that make a difference in the tannins and everything. The, 
the thing I suppose I particularly resent are restaurant markups. Say, so have my Taurus on the, the list for $45, something like that. Of that $45, I get 13 You know? Now, wait a second, huh? And that's if I'm selling them, I mean, craziness, it seems to me. And to them, it's like, you know, Newton's second law of thermodynamics or something. It's just one of the basic physical properties of the universe that uh, a restaurant should get that kind of markup. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll just open uh, a bottle of wine that I've made and taste it, and it just, I mean, it's, uh, every once in a while, it'll just knock me dead. This would be so damned wonderful. And that's definitely what makes it all worthwhile. And the idea that that happens with other people with my wine is also extremely satisfying. Every once in a while, I mean, I'll hear from somebody that, you know, had a bottle of the wine in some restaurant in South Carolina or something. It was a state I've never been to. I've never met the people. I've never been to the restaurant. And they just say, you know, this wine is absolutely, that, that is the most wonderful thing I've ever tasted. I just can't thank you enough or whatever. I mean, that's extremely satisfying. You know, just feel that, you know, you've done something and all this, you know, dirt and hassle and, you know, all the rest of the work that's involved. And that you've really brought something off that's been a real pleasure. I mean, that's the whole point of the whole deal. You know, that it's just a, one of life's really great sensual pleasures. So that's definitely what makes it worthwhile from my point of view. Definitely. <laughs>